Assistance Command Vietnam Studies and Observations Group MACVSOG was a highly classified multi-service United States Special Operations Unit which conducted covert unconventional warfare operations prior to and during the Vietnam War. Established on 24 January 1964, the unit conducted strategic reconnaissance missions in the Republic of Vietnam, South Vietnam, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, North Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, carried out the capture of enemy prisoners, rescued downed pilots. Conducted rescue operations to retrieve prisoners of war throughout Southeast Asia and conducted clandestine agent team activities and psychological operations. The unit participated in most of the significant campaigns of the Vietnam War, including the Gulf of Tonkin incident which precipitated increased American involvement, Operation Steel Tiger, Operation Tiger Hound, the Tet Offensive, Operation Commando Hunt, the Cambodian Campaign, Operation Lam Sun 719, and the Easter Offensive. The unit was downsized and renamed Strategic Technical Directorate Assistance Team 158 on 1 May 1972 to support the transfer of its work to the Strategic Technical Directorate of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, part of the Vietnamization effort. The Studies and Observations Group, also known as SOG, MAC SOG, and MAC V SOG, was a top secret, joint unconventional warfare task force created on 24 January 1964 by the Joint Chiefs of Staff as a subsidiary command of the Military Assistance Command Vietnam, MAC V. The unit would eventually consist primarily of personnel from the United States Army Special Forces, the United States Navy SEALs, the United States Air Force, USAF, the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, and elements of the United States Marine Corps Force Reconnaissance Units. Hi, my name's Marianne and I'm the hostess with the History of Mac V. Sog, and I'm here doing an interview with uh, David Gordon. Um, so I guess we can start with the first question here. Uh, growing up, did you have any people who were in the military that influenced your life? No, I did not. None of, none of my family was ever in the military. My dad, I think, was drafted for a short time and got out for uh, medical reasons. So there was no really military history in my family at all. So it kind of started with you? Yeah, it did. It started with me and I think it's ended with me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as a child, did you have any desire to join the military? Not really, um, because it wasn't in my family. It wasn't something that that was prominent in my thought processes and going to school and and growing up. I had you know plans of, of thoughts of being maybe even being a doctor or doing something like that. My, that was my mother's push was to me be a doctor, but I just uh, I would just enjoyed life. It just wasn't part of my my program. Mm -hmm. So what do you think it was that got you into the military? I got drafted. <laughs> That's how I got into the military. I got drafted in the, old, in, the, in the original draft before they had the lottery or anything. Uh, it was in the early throes of the Vietnam War. I graduated from high school. I went to college for a little bit. Didn't do probably as well as I should. So my college deferment wasn't effective. And next thing I knew, I got a letter from Uncle Sam saying we not only want you, but you are now in. So that's how I end up in the military. Wow. And when did you first hear about Special Forces? I think I really first heard about Special Forces when I went to what we call AIT, Advanced Individual Training. I, I became a medic, went there to be a medic at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And that's also where they train the Special Forces medics. And in my uh, going around and talking with people had ran into a couple of special forces medics and they talked about it So that's when I first got introduced to the idea of special forces I think we heard about it with the movies and things like that, but it never was really Prominent in my in the process till I ran into these special forces medics who were going through training When did you go through selection and did you like it? For special forces, or just, yeah, for special forces, I didn't necessarily go through a selection. What happened is um, I actually tried to get into special forces while uh, as a enlisted young uh, spec four, but I had had some problems with the law when I was much <laughs> younger, and they didn't quite feel I was, I met their specifications. So I went on and uh, went uh, finished my time in Fort Sam Houston 
and then was sent to Germany. And then from Germany, I went to NCO Academy, and then they decided I needed to become an officer. Uh, again, they selected me. Uh, after I became an officer, I chose uh, to go with Special Forces when you have a chance to choose where you want to go. And I'd gone through Infantry OCS and was selected and went to Fort Bragg and was assigned to uh, 7th Group and then went through the Special Forces Officers Training while I was there. Okay. Did you know about Mac VSOG while you were still in the States? Not really. I mean, there was some talks about it, uh, and we I'd heard about it, um, and of course it was, uh, you, couldn't, you didn't know much about it because it was all top secret at the time, but they knew that they had those things going on, and the talk about it cut it, you know, it got my interest, so uh, I didn't know the whole details on it until I got to Vietnam, and out of, I don't know, young stupidity, I went ahead and volunteered <laughs> for it, and that's how I got into Mac Saw because I volunteered. I said, "What the heck? I'm over here, Special Force. I might as well go do something exciting, uh -huh. more exciting than just being there." Yep. And you were assigned to uh, CCN Da Nang. What did you think of the compound? Well, the compound was great. Uh, it was somewhat isolated. Uh, we, ha I mean, it wasn't by itself any place. We had other types of units on either side, um, but the compound was, but the compound was very uh, touchy at the time because they had had. Uh, a year before they'd had the major uh, raid on the mm -hmm. compound where several were killed uh, in, in August. Uh, and so everybody was still pretty much on edge. So security was very high at the time uh, when I first got there. Okay. And did you arrive to CCN after the August 23rd, 1968 Sapper attack? Yeah, and then that's the attack I was, was talking about. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's why everybody was still pretty much on edge, because that had really done a lot of damage to the compound. Uh, and the mm -hmm. people in the compound, a lot, of, a lot were lost. So the tension was still high, pretty, yeah. very high, and we, high security. Even though we had other units on either side of us, we didn't want to take any chances. Um, so so yeah. that, I was after that. So. And was there still visible evidence of what happened that night? Just the tension. Yeah. And there was some physical evidence of, of, of yeah. buildings that had been damaged and destroyed. But it was the security and the constant reminder, you've mm -hmm. got to stay alert. Yeah. Uh, so it just wasn't the just... And, yeah, yeah. Right. It wasn't just that you had to be alert and ready to do things when you went on mission. Mm -hmm. You had to be alert and ready to respond there in the compound. Yeah. And they probably had different procedures. Yeah. They had after. changed some of the procedures and things. And, and it upped the security of uh, perimeter securities, particularly at night. Yeah. And uh, you were assigned to a hatchet forces. Can you tell the audience what a hatchet force was comprised of? Yeah, a hatchet force was comprised of, was essentially there were two companies, A and B company, and each company had uh, three platoons. And I was assigned as platoon leader to one of the platoons in A Company. And it comprised of uh, anywhere from three to four Americans, and all the rest were mountain yards or indigenous personnel. And we trained as a platoon. Uh, not a lot of people. Uh, we had not a full platoon like you'd think of a, a regular mm -hmm. uh, our, our American platoon. We had usually in the neighborhood of between of 25 to, to, to maybe 30 uh, members in the platoon and unlike the recon teams which were much much smaller uh, we had to go in with force um, and the, the story the, the, the storyline on part of that was we weren't we were too big to hide and too small <laughs> to really fight so we were always on edge yeah. when we went in on a mission and they, it usually took a lot of helicopter assets to get us in and get us out which was also a problem because you were, you were able, they were able, 
better able, the enemy was better able to spot with so many helicopters. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what tribe were your Mont, sorry, I don't know. Mountain Yards. They were Brew, Brew Mountain Yards from our local villages. Uh, and I say local, local within the region, not local within uh, the Da Nang area. Uh, and we had worked with them a, a great deal, and we had many of them on many of our teams and platoons. Um, great people, um, dedicated, hard, trained, hard, trained hard, and we're always there for you. So uh, I was very fortunate to work with them. Did your hatchet force have a name? It did not have a name. It went by, uh, it, was, it was A Company, uh, I think it was uh, Second Platoon A Company. Uh, unlike the recon teams that all had their special names <laughs> and significations, special badges and, and all that sort of, we were just basically aligned very similar to an American uh, infantry outfit. Okay. And did you have a code name? Me personally, yeah, my code name was Phoenix, um, which was interesting how it all ended up Mm -hmm. uh, as we venture further into the, how the missions went, but that was my code name. I picked that one because I had actually lived in Phoenix as a young, as a young man, oh, okay. and I uh, went to, went to grammar school in Phoenix. And I just they asked what I wanted, so I grabbed Phoenix as my code <laughs> name. That part out. Uh, your first training mission was on Monkey Mountain. Can you tell the audience where Monkey Mountain was and what the terrain was like? Well, Monkey Mountain was an area, a training area, fairly secure training area north, in the north northern area uh, of Da Nang, outside of Da Nang proper. It was um, it was good because you could go out there and you could kind of spread out and practice some of your your maneuvers and work with work with your troops and find out how they do and 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 continue to improve your your maneuvers. So, and, and the terrain, it wasn't real jungle as much as you'd find in, in the, the mountains and things, because mm -hmm. it wasn't really a mountain. Yeah. Uh, it was a high hill, you might say. Uh, and, but you could practice going, going through jungle, doing some, you know, spreading out where you could, keeping track of your people, doing some security. And there was a few streams, you could practice crossing streams or crossing danger areas. So that was what was important about it, that you could do it secure, somewhat securely. Okay. And my understanding that Monkey Mountain um, was fairly safe was a fairly safe area for training, but there was time to time a Viet Cong there. Yeah, uh, I had never, you know, on my training a couple of times I went there and never ran into them, but the, they had had some incidences where. The Viet Cong would come in, mm. and and maybe they were doing their training. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Did you hear any stories? Huh? Did you hear any stories about that? No, not really. No, nobody really expanded upon it. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest danger zone we had was, of course, and if I could uh, ad lib here a little bit, was Marble Mountain, which is right next to our compound, which they had uh, Viet Cong areas on Marble Mountain uh, in caves and things. So that was actually more, uh, more an area where they had the stories. Okay. Uh, but Monkey Mountain, to me, was it was a good training area. You still had to be alert, always, always mm -hmm. alert. Yeah. Yeah. You went to sniper school. Where was the school located? A little bit of history on that is they decided that we, they wanted to try to get some snipers in, in, in the SOG missions. So they, what they did is they selected two, two individuals out of each of the th three camps, CCS, CC, C, and CCM. And I was, uh, I was relatively new there. I'd just been assigned. So they figured I could go. Uh, and I had a little history on marksmanship, uh, good history on marksmanship. Mm -hmm. So myself and uh, five others were sent. First, we went down to Saigon to be briefed on what they expected of us in the, in the main headquarters in Saigon, um, in about 35. Then uh, we went down to Dong Tam, which is down in the southern portion of, of South Vietnam. And they had there 
uh, a whole sniper school. And the sniper school was set up by the marksmanship training unit out of Fort Benning, Georgia. And, and they were the guys who would do, they would train people in marksmanship, but they were actually training the competitive portions of the Army marksmanship units for, for competition. So they were very good. Um, so we went down there and we trained and then uh, finished up our training and came back uh, to try to deploy with what we had learned mm -hmm. in our particular mission. Yeah. So, Can you tell me about some weapons that you used? Yeah, uh, what we used was M14 National Matches, uh, which were, uh, they were built up from a, net, from a normal M14. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, to where they were much, much more ac accurate. We also used national match ammunition, which was much more accurate. So we were training and we were shooting targets with iron sights and iron type peep sights with, with a thin blade out to 600 meters. And we were shooting with scope that the system that they had out to 900 meters. And that's what we were, sh that's the wow. accuracy we were shooting. And we, were, and we would be able to hit a person-sized target. This wasn't a bullseye type training. This was a target type training, and we, or, or tar, not a target, but a, but a silhouette type training. And we were able to hit those silhouettes with kill or wound shots out that far wow. with those with those weapons. How long was your schooling? The schooling was two weeks, um, and uh, and we went through some things while we were there. Uh, we get mortar attacks down in Dongtam all the time because it was down in the Delta. So we periodically have to head for bunkers because of mortar attacks. And one of the, another side note is while I was there, uh, we'd done our training for the day and we'd gone to the club uh, to have a few drinks and watch. I think we were going to watch uh, one of the football games that uh, ASPN had brought in. It was, it was taped. And that was back when they taped the football games. We were in there, we were going to watch football game. And I hear this voice on the other side of this wall. And I, I kind of, and I go back and I turn around and I look around the corner. It was my drill sergeant from when I went through basic training. I remembered his voice. That's how wow. impressed, that's how it impressed me. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, we're talking two, three years later, I'm here. The same drill sergeant's voice, and he was there being, he'd been deployed to the 9th Division down there in, South, in, in Dog Cab, but that was kind of a funny side story. <laughs> yeah, what a good uh, memory. Yeah, wow. <laughs> you impressed me. <laughs> uh, let's see. Can you tell us about your mission on October 22nd, 1969? I can, and it'll probably be a little extended. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I can just ask you a couple questions, like what your weapon was. Yeah. And, and, and actually, I might be able to just go through that. Our mission was, uh, we've been on, I've been on a couple of missions. This was my, this was my third, actually, out-of-country mission uh, in Laos. Um, the, we, were, we were scheduled to go in and try to locate a POW camp. And I do not remember whether it was an American POW camp or a uh, Vietnamese-type for. Uh, PO, Vietnamese POWs, but we were supposed to try to locate this camp, and um, so we had trained for it. We had done our, I'd done my recon, uh, some aerial recons, looking for LZs where we were going to go in, and we we got ourselves all put together for it. Uh, all, all our packing, all our weapons, all our foods that we, you know, rations we needed, our radio equipments, everything was checked out, and then we were sent from Da Nang. We were sent up to Fubai which is where we were going to launch out of to go into in, in the country, or out of country, but into the mission area. Um, weapons, uh, I always, uh, with, with the platoon, I always carried, had them carry one M60 machine gun. Uh, the rest of us had, the uh, rest of the, my mountain yards, pr primarily the rest of the uh, mm -hmm. platoon, they had uh, M16s. I had a couple of people who were signed with what we call thump guns, so uh, M79 grenade launcher. Uh, and uh, I personally carried a car 15, as did my other three Americans, mm. 
And I also carried a sawed off M79, which was very unique. I carried it on my hip, and that was just strictly to break contact with. If we made contact, I had I could shoot out quickly shoot out some grenades and get mm -hmm. the heck out of Dodge <laughs> or get, get back in the area. But uh, and I required everybody ex, uh, except the M79 people to carry. Uh, uh, an extra hundred rounds of, of M60 machine gun ammunition, so we had plenty of machine gun ammunition, and everybody also had to carry a, uh, a two and a half pound block of C4, uh, along with the persons who uh, the Americans would carry the the, uh, the debt cord and the uh, blasting caps for the C4. So, and then we had claymores. We had uh, spaced about eight claymores out amongst the platoon. So that was our, that was our weaponry. That it sounds we like you guys were prepared. We tried to be prepared, <laughs> yes. We did definitely try to be prepared because you never know what you're going to run into. And as a result, uh, I'm glad we were prepared because we ran into a mess. So, How was your uniform situated? Uh, we, we wore uh, basically just green uniforms. We didn't wear the Tiger uniforms. We were we wore US type uniforms. Uh, the yards had their types of uniforms at the end. They, they, sometimes it was a mix and match, but that was okay. Um, but we went in with no identification. Uh, we mm. had no identification on us of who we were. No dog tags, no nothing. Uh, and that was done for our own personal security reasons should we be captured. And also I can add now, and you can take it out if you need to. Uh, we were not supposed to be there. Americans were not supposed to be there at that time. That was all hush hush, top secret stuff. It's all been brought out in the open now, so I think I can say that. So that was another reason we carried no identification, which became a, a problem in an earlier mission that I went on that I had no identification when I got medevaced. Uh oh. Yeah. That was another story. <laughs> That's one of those Catch-22 stories. Uh, so, anyway, we, as, as I said earlier, we got the mission to, to try to locate a POW camp. We went from, uh, we, we geared up, we went through isolation, went through all the, all the intel that we knew, uh, training, and then we were uh, taken from uh, Da Nang to Fubai, where we were going to be launched, actually launched into Laos. And uh, when we got to Fubai, the weather had come in, and so it wasn't uh, good for trying to launch us. They couldn't, they couldn't see what clouds had come in. So we spent a couple of days in Fubai, and then the weather broke, uh, where they, was, they had what they called holes. They were going to put you in. We got a hole in the sky. You know, we're going to put you in. So they launched us put us in, put the platoon in. We hit the ground um, and there was no activity so we got we got in safely. Uh, we moved around, we started moving to the area trying to trying to determine where we were going because it was kind of somewhat of an area mission where we didn't have any specifics of where the camp might be so it was we were going to do an area recon and we started moving and all of a sudden we started seeing trails and the more, the more we moved into these trail areas the more extensive they got and then we finally realized that what it was was a bivouac area for well, maybe an up to a, uh, a North Vietnamese a regiment it was that much that extensive with they had bunkers they had areas they had even little signs on the trails where it go so we decided it was not a good place to be uh, and we had some, what was called uh, Eldon Sun ammunition, which was ammunition that was booby trapped. Mm -hmm. We left that ammunition there, and we and we got out of the area and found a place to stay overnight, uh, to set up our security and spend the night, uh, and it's, so we could move on and see if we could find other areas in, in our recon mission. Well, we spent the night, no activity. I saw a lot of lights down below. Uh, because we were up on a, a high ridge, saw a lot of lights in the trails down below. Uh, looked like vehicle lights, the mm -hmm. way they were moving. And so I contacted the radio communications that we had and, uh, with um, 
they had aerial flights that, that, that flew the area that we could contact with and said, this is what we see and this is where I think it is, you know, this is on, on my maps and my, my compass. And they said, well, we don't have any aircraft up. The weather's not all that good, Well, we'll fire artillery out there. And I said, oh, well, what do you got? And they said, we have what well, within the 175 millimeter cannon artillery had, which was the least accurate artillery piece they had. And they said, well, you're not too far from the gun tar on, on the same line as the, as the gun target. And I said, mm -hmm. you know, I think I'll pass because I knew that the, 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 the problems with the 175. Mm -hmm. So that night got through. The next morning we get up and I make my contact with Covey uh, uh, to make sure we're okay and, and okay. And he's trying to find us. He can't find us. He says, well, where are you? And I says, well, I'm right here, you know. And, and finally, I've got my mirror to shine, shine on him. So finally he says, well, that's RDF, which means he, I can key my radio and he can come in with an RDF. And all of a sudden, he finds me. And, he, and, I, and the thing I hear, and I hope I could say this, is basically, is, oh, shit. <laughs> and what it was, we weren't even on, in our area. I wasn't even on the maps, which is one of the reasons I couldn't really identify where I was mm. on the map versus the terrain, as I now realize. And they had put us in the wrong area, completely off our maps. And he says, we need to get you out of there now. And so all the arrangements were made, and the decision was made by the commander of Command and Control North at the, at the CCN that they were gonna reinsert us and continue the mission. So they pulled us out, and they put us in another area on my maps. Oh, what so a start. we're now <laughs> reinserted, and, and, which means we had, I think, six helicopters reinserting us, and they'd go in, in in sections, which is a lot of noise, a lot of, a lot of activity. Well, we got in, we moved all that, we got in, got settled, got or, orient, oriented to the maps, and we, we moved, we moved all that day, and we went ridge lines up and down ridge lines through streams and up and finally it was getting close to the time we needed to settle in for the evening for the night and uh, what we call an RON rest overnight spot so I found a good ridge line uh, and we set up camp I put out security uh, so we set the night so we continue mission the next day um, during the night my interpreter kept coming to me and says we we hear on the radio we hear VC Buku VC, and I says, okay. So I made sure that we had a little extra security that night out on the perimeter. Well, we get up the next morning and we get things settled, everybody where they need to be, decide which directions we're gonna go. I set up who's gonna be uh, the point and um, we start to move out just as, just as it starts getting daylight. And I'm usually, really, I always place myself fairly close to the front. Uh, I had a, my I had to point people out, but I was back just far enough that I can control what they're doing, plus control a platoon behind me, and I had my platoon sergeant, uh, Sergeant Schultz, Schultz. And, my, and my two other Americans. Well, I, I, I put one American on on, the, on our point team, uh, and then I was next, and then Sergeant Schultz would bring would be the center, and the other American would bring up the the rear security and the point people got just down the hill over the ridge line and all hell broke loose and they we got hit with rpgs and automatic weapons fire and we we immediately hit cover we returned fire and things settled down uh, i brought machine gun up to return fire we, and we were firing everything we what we had safely in our in our our immediate action drills that we had, we had the right people firing at the right places uh, without hitting our own people. Well, things settled down and the point people worked their way back and I had, at that point, I had uh, one American wounded and four indigenous wounded. And so we, we got, I got everything settled down and I put Sergeant Schultz in charge of the platoon because we still had one indigenous down there that didn't, was considered KIA, we didn't know at the time for sure, but did, didn't come back with the point people. 
and actually it wasn't just the point people that got hit, I got a couple of people hit that were further closer to me. So I, young, some maybe stupid, I, I grabbed two of my most experienced yards and went down to recover the body. I'm not going to leave anybody behind me. You have to excuse me a little bit. Don't worry. So we walked down the ridge line, got below where we figured where, where we knew he was, and then set up the security and worked our way back, picked him up and brought him back. And then I notified, by then, the world kind of knew we were under fire because I'd already radio, had a radio in. I had one of, my, one of my people radio in that we were under fire. We'd, been, we'd made contact. So we started getting the support that we needed from Covey, at least radio-wise, and told him I got five, I've got five down, I've got one wounded, one dead and four wounded, one American wounded. And so the next work was to try to get out of there. Uh, but there was no area that they could move us to to get out. So they brought in, initially they brought in a, a helicopter with, which was called a jungle penetrator. And what it is, is a big heavy thing that they can drop down and, 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 and sort of like seats come out on it. Mm -hmm. And you can put your people on there. So I put my three, my two serious wounded to my Americans on, American on that. And I kept the one minor wounded and the, and the KIA back because there was no sense of evacuating him. And got them out of there. So now we need to figure out what we're going to do. And that, that, that's when I really found out we didn't have an LZ to go to. Uh, Covey looked for one, couldn't find us, so we had to cut our own LZ in, in the tall trees and, and double, double, triple canopy. And so we went to work to trying to cut this, and this is still in the morning. Mm -hmm. So we're trying, and I set out good security all the way around, and we went to work with what demolitions we had, what other tools we had to try to cut the trees down and try to get at least something that a helicopter could get mm. in there to get us out. So LZ is landing zone? Landing zone, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I should have been more specific on that. Part of the problem of being in the military, you have a lot of acronyms and you think everybody mm. else knows them. Mm -hmm. um, so we spent that day trying to get everything out. We finally got an LZ cut about early afternoon that they could get a helicopter in. We hadn't had any contact. We had, we had no contact, but we'd had probing actions. In other words, they, we, we'd get fire from different er areas around us, uh, weapons, small weapons fire, uh, kind of like, like I say, probing actions. Uh, they'd already done quite a bit of damage with us, uh, with their, with their rifle propelled grenades and their automatic weapons. So finally I called in, we're going to evac, we're going to get the platoon out of there because we, we, we're, we're compromised, mm -hmm. we're in a bad area. And Covey's seeing activity all around us from the air. He's seeing it. And they already had helicopter gunships now in the area to try to protect us. A few. So we bring in the first helicopter, and, and, and the landing zone the area we cut wasn't really clean. The aircraft had to come down like this and then move sideways a little bit and then come down some more to try to keep from getting blade strikes and hitting mm -hmm. the trees with their blades. So we got the first bird out of there and then the second bird come in and I evacuated a number of people. My, I evacuated actually my KIA and uh, uh, another wound, WIA. And then the, the second bird came in and I put my, one, my other American, the one that wasn't wounded on it, and got them out of there. So he's with that group. Uh, so, I, so I know that they're okay. Well, unfortunately, that bird took a lot of fire coming out, the second bird, and uh, end up wounding my American that was on there and, and a couple of yards. And that's all I know. They may have killed some people, but they shot the, the aircraft up so bad it had to fly away and land. Well, once that happened, then the priorities came to rescuing the crew and the helicopter, mm -hmm. the people in the helicopter and the crew of the helicopter. So all assets were pretty much diverted to doing that. Mm -hmm. While I was left to fend kind of for myself with only a couple of helicopter gunships supporting us. Wow. 
So now we just set up security, and right now, now we had 12 of us on the ground. That's all over on the ground, myself and Sergeant Schultz, and, and 10 yards, 10 of my mountain yards. Um, and so we set up, I set up perimeter, and it took so long to get them out and then try to get assets refueled, re-rigged, re re-come in, it finally got dark. Nightfall it hit, and now they got to get the rest of us out. So we bring in. They decide. They finally they've got it. Where they're going to bring us out, and and, and it was getting dark early, you know, because this is October. Mm -hmm. So it got dark probably around six o'clock. So it's not like it's way into the midnight. It's, it just had just gotten dark. So now they're trying to rescue us at night, and so we bring in the first aircraft, come down, and I had position myself on one side uh, actually if you're looking at where the aircraft was oriented towards the front of the aircraft I was on the right side of the aircraft and Sergeant Schultz was on the left side of the aircraft I had five yards with me he had five yards with him and the object was to thin your to thin your your your, your forces but still have security so he was supposed to get on with two yards and I was going to put three yards uh, of mine on so Aircraft came in, settled down as best they could. Bam, we put the people on, and the aircraft lifted off. And I looked across. Sergeant Schultz was still there. Instead of getting on, he put two yards on in his place. And I was not happy because he was supposed to, you know. See, my philosophy was I was always first in and last out. And that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. But he didn't pay, he didn't like my philosophy, I guess. But anyway, I, I looked at him and I pointed at him and I just kind of shook my finger and he went and put his hands together with two fingers and went like this. I just told her what? That he was going to stay with me. So anyway, the second helicopter comes in and, and, and this is some information I didn't know ahead of time but I have found out later. Mm -hmm. The second helicopter was due in. Well, it came in to, to, to come into the LC, to come in, hover, and come down. Well, it, it missed the LC. And so the, 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 the captain that was in charge of the, the group of helicopters would come in. He says, the, the, the pilot of the other helicopter says, hey, I'm sorry, I'll come back around. And the captain who was monitoring all of this says, no, I'll come in. I'll take it. And, and I've read everything about him, he's a great person, but he was two weeks from going home. Anyway, he comes in and he starts to come in and I'm come, trying to help guide him in. He says, no, my crew chief will bring me in. It's good. He comes in and just gets ready to set down and he can't quite set the, the skids on the ground. And I toss my two yards on and Sergeant Schultz jumps, jumps on from his side, and all of a sudden, the whole world opens up below us. And we're just catching all sorts of, of fire of rifle, uh, projected grenades, automatic weapons fire, all from all around, almost all around us. And the helicopter just starts lifting off. And I haven't, hit, I haven't got on yet. So I jump for the helicopter, and I grab him put my arm around it. There's a pole that goes between the crew chief mm -hmm. and the pilots. And, and, and or no, I'm sorry, between the crew chief and door gunners, and actually they're door gunners, mm -hmm. and where the, where the body, where the main cabin, of, or not cabin, but the area for, for everybody else to go, and then you have the pilots up front. Well, I put my arm around that, that pole and put my knees on the skid, grab, and got my knees onto the skids and the helicopter's coming off the ground. And I'm firing my weapon, they're firing their weapons, and all of a sudden, we just start going. Uh, we start going sideways. And I didn't realize it in all the action and stuff. I thought we had, uh, he was dropping down to gain, to gain speed in mm -hmm. order to get out. And all of a sudden, I realized he's not gaining any speed uh, because the helicopters have to do that if they're overloaded or, or, or the altitude's too high. They've got to gain some forward speed mm -hmm. to, to, to go... Uh, forward the helicopter had jerked and 
it hit the trees and flipped and flipped me off off the aircraft and I'm falling through the trees and the helicopter's falling behind me and I'm looking up and I fell far enough that I said I didn't fear I was going to make it I told myself I'm not going to make it and I hit the ground and the helicopter hit the ground all all around me I mean it's like it was as close all around me as you are to me and I just kind of so it all came bit. down at the it same time. It all came time. down on top of me, but missed me. Mm. Um, you know, you, you see it in the movies, and, and, and it's just slow motion all the way down. And I hit the ground, and I'm hurt. I'm, I'm, I know I'm hurt. I, I, I just, and I'm afraid this thing's going to blow up. So I do what I can. I, I, I my rucksack, I had, I had to jettison my rucksack because it was just too heavy. I hurt too much. I crawled into the brush, oh, probably, I'd say 30, 40 feet away, just to get away from the helicopter because I didn't know if it was going to burn, blow up or burn. And I got myself situated in the trees. And then, and I can't remember right now, I'd have to read up, but at some point, I finally get myself put together and I see that the helicopter didn't blow up so I crawl back to the helicopter to check to see if there's anybody there and everybody's dead. Everybody I could touch and, and I am have to touch because it's night, I can't see that well. I'm, everybody I touched was dead. They were gone. There was, there was no life in them. And I can't remember if that's before or after I contacted Covey. Then I crawled back to my hiding place, and I'm, I'm in communication with Covey, and I, like I said, I'd have to read that, and I apologize mm -hmm. that I don't quite remember. Uh, and I told Covey, I says, everybody's dead, and I'm hurt. Um, I touched myself. I didn't. I wasn't bleeding any, mm -hmm. but I was just hurt. I just hurt really bad. Yeah. And he says, "Well, okay. Put up a pen flare. Put up a flare. Let me know exactly where you are." So I put up this pen flare, and it's a little pen, about this long. It's got a flare on the end of it, and you can shoot it, and it goes up through the canopy. Mm -hmm. And the next thing, within about five minutes after that, I start hearing this noise coming from the helicopter. And I figure it's all over now. They're they're coming after me, and so I throw my weapon on automatic. And I figure I'm going to go. I'm not going to go alone. And this deep southern voice calls out, and it's the only thing. It turns out that the door gunner, the two door gunners, had meant gone the other direction. They were saved in the crash because they're back in their cubicles and they got helmets on and everything, and they, they actually survived the crash uh, and with just a few minor scrapes and injuries. They had seen the pen flare, so they came back. But I didn't know that and when the Southern Voices, the only thing that saved their lives, because I was ready to shoot them up. So they came back, I, pulled, I called them in, and they told me, they said, we, we know that there's somebody on the other side of the helicopter, one of your people, and I said, can you go get him? So they went, and it was one of my yards, had survived, had been thrown from the helicopter and survived, and he had a broken leg, broken femur. As it turns out, you know, in checking him out. And as if you remember, I had been a medic before I became an officer, mm -hmm. so I had, and I'd already hit myself with two, two big shots of morphine just to try to, just to try to survive. So I let Covey know that we've got survivors now and who, you know, what we got. And so they says, well, we're gonna get you out of there. So they came in with these strings, McGuire rigs on strings, 100 feet, because that's how they were normally rigged. Of course, we had to wait till they got there. And, and the tension is just high. Because he says, we got you protected. And uh, they came in and they weren't long enough. They couldn't get to the. We couldn't reach them. Mm -hmm. They they couldn't get them low enough to reach. So we're trying to move a little bit, and I'm trying to move, and and and, and I'm having a lot of trouble. I I, I 
was actually using something to as, as kind of, and they were helping me and helping the ark, the two door gunners, and we just couldn't get to a place where they could get to us. So they said, we got to re-rig. Says, but we'll we'll keep you covered. Mm -hmm. So anyway, and then he says, they'd already uh, once we went down, they had uh, they did declared a prairie prairie fire. Where well, prairie fire means you've got a team in horrible, horrible shape, and they divert every asset that they have to support you. So um, we had to wait. So we, I said, I told them, and they, I'm the only one that had a real weapon. The rest of them, they had 45s or nine mil, uh, 45s then, and I had the only automatic weapon, the Car 15, as I found out later from a friend of mine. Actually, a medic to help get me out. So we're set up till they have to go back all the way to base and put 200 foot strings, ropes long enough so they could reach us. In the meantime, they had alerted what's called a bright light team. And a bright light team is already on, they're, they're on standby all the time. And what they are is a special group. They're already, they're loaded up for bear. Small team. They've trained for this, and their job is to come in and help get out whoever's in trouble. It's a rescue mission, is what it is. And it turned out to be, so they came in and said, we got a bright light team coming in to get you out, because now they had enough time to get a bright light team in, or they had to. So they get the bright light team on the ground and tell me, now we, we need to get you guys together, because we aren't, they're put in a different location. And one of the most dangerous missions in, 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 on the tactical side is a link-up operation. You've got two friendlies trying to find each other and not shoot each other up. And we're doing this at night, already wounded. Somehow, some miracle, we were able to connect without shooting each other up. So I finally find them or they find us. It was a combination. And they, and the person who ended up being, I found out later, was Lynn Black, who's a, who's a, a, a very uh, heroic person in his own right. He was the team leader. He had one medic and three mountain yards. Uh, his special got group. And I go up to him and I just say, I'm so glad you're here. And I only knew him by Blackjack, because that was his code name. I found out years later who he was and finally met him 35 years afterwards. But anyway, I walk him and says, okay, we need to get these people out. And he looked at me and he says, no, you're going out. Okay, you're the boss. So anyway, he in the mountain yard, they pulled us out first. They wanted to get two two people out because the strings were so long. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's when I told you about they drug and then they drug us through the trees. Well, the medic went out with them with my mountain yard on his lap because the mountain yard was too small to fit in the McGuire rig safely. Well, he got knocked out also, and he's hanging on to the mountain yard and himself, and I'm hanging on for dear life. Because I'm not going to fall again. I've already fell and fall, fell once. Mm -hmm. Got us out, and they finally had to get us down because they were running low on fuel, I guess. And they come down, and again the pilot not remembering, and we were taking gunfire coming out. Wow. The pilot not remembering how long we were, he's low on fuel, ends up not. He keep trying to come into the 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 where he was coming into the airfield, ends up dragging me across oh. the tarmac, and so I'm being drug across the tarmac. Finally, they get out. I remember. Then I remember. Most of the time, I'm conscious. This is the one time I, I've kind of I felt I lost consciousness. I remember them kind of grabbing me and putting me into the cargo area, of the helicopter, and getting me to the hospital. Then they got the other two out. I don't know whatever happened to the door gunners, you know, where they went or anything like that. Stepping back a little ways on the, 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 the helicopter that went down, 
I found out many years later in some after action reports that what had happened is the left front side of the helicopter, I was on the left side, sorry, not the right side, was hit by a rifle, a, 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 a RPG, rifle projected grenade, and blew up the front end of the, that whole front end of the helicopter and, and actually killed the two pilots right away. And that's why we went down. And that's what, that was what I was feeling when I felt the jerk and then, wow. and then going down. And so they both, everybody else was killed. And my sergeant was killed. And had he done what I told him to do, he'd still be alive. And he got on that first bird, or you know, the bird that I told him to get on, he'd still be alive. So that's why the emotions are there. Yeah. I mean, I can't even imagine how hard that must have been and talking about it and reliving all Yeah, I've had to. And uh, I, I keep saying, I, I, I would go back to what I wrote. My partner, who I lost to cancer, uh, almost 14 years ago. She had made me sit down and start writing this out, finally, uh, after a lot of years. And that's, I've been able to do some research and find out more about it. To include that, the medic that came in to get me, he, he volunteered for that team. He got out of the army, became a doctor. He and his family live in San Antonio, Texas, and this last year when I went down to Texas to do some photography, I'd been in contact with him, and it had been 50 years. But through SOAR, our organization here, I found out, they found out, he found out who I was, contacted me, and I went and was able to spend a couple of days with, with, with the family, and it was just great. Wow. But he's the one that told me, I was the only one that had a weapon, and he told me more about what happened from the time they found me, we connected until they finally got me out. So that's where I am able to expand on my, on some of the story. So that is, uh, that was the mission. Uh, not good, left a lot of scars, a lot of dead. I finally been able to make contact about Six years ago, I made contact with Sergeant Schultz's niece, and we're in contact and back and forth, which has been just great. Um, it's helped me. The VA has helped me in my therapy. The VA has also helped me in healing all my wounds, other than my emotional wounds. That's how I came out of that with a, with, a, with a broken, with a fractured back, neck. Uh, I've had three shoulder, shoulder surgeries, um, and a bunch of other things. So, it was an experience. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Coffee. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to some other questions that I had here. That would be fine. Yeah, let's do. Mm -hmm. um, what year did you go to Ranger School? I went to Ranger School in 1971. Um, I had been medevaced. I went back to the States. I went back to Special Forces. Uh, once I got out of the hospital, um, I was working, I worked a couple of interesting missions while, while there, and I, want, I, I needed to go back to Vietnam. Uh, it, I, I left some unfinished business there. And so uh, I had an opportunity to go to Ranger School, so I went to Ranger School uh, even after all my injuries, uh, went through ranger school and immediately back to Vietnam and went back to doing the, the same thing I had done before, working with uh, SOG, uh, Studies and Observation Group. Uh, that's just me. Mm -hmm. Footloose, fancy free, and too much testosterone. <laughs> Uh, and you went back to Vietnam for two more tours. Uh, what was your assignment during those tours? My assignment, my first part of the, the tour, my assignment, well, I went to CCC instead of CCN, and I became a targeting officer. And so my job was to, to go to Saigon, to the main operations center at Op 35. We develop our targets. I come back with these targets, and we start developing the, the uh, intel on the targets. And then we'd be assigning those targets to teams as we felt the targets were necessary to go do. 
Uh, I also worked a couple of in-country missions while I was there um, until, and I did that until um, the MACV SOG was, uh, they had decided that they didn't know, they no longer needed them. So they deactivated the units. So I had no place to go. So from there, I went to a uh, an operations called uh, Fank Training Command, which was training Cambodians. They'd bring Cambodian battalions, about 500 Cambodians, and some of them only in shower shoes and and pajamas. And we train them in combat operations. And we did this in Domba Tin. And there was a couple of camps that did that. And that's what I did. I was the operations officer for training and doing the training for them until I finally uh, came back to the United States, um, which was a very interesting command. And kind of an interesting part of that, for those of you who know uh, uh, General, Lieutenant General uh, Keith Joseph Kellogg, um, who is retired, and he does some stuff for, for uh, Fox News, I know. But uh, he was a captain when I knew him, and he was my executive officer when I was in Dalmatin and the Frank Training Command. So it turns out to be a very small world. You know, and I'm glad for him. He's, he was a dynamic individual, a great executive officer, uh, really kept us together. But that was, a, that was a rewarding job also, training people from nothing to uh, very so somewhat complex military operations, and then they'd go back to Cambodia and fight the war there. Post Vietnam, uh, there was a reduction in wartime officers. Uh, did this affect you? Absolutely, because I was a uh, ninety-day wonder, as they called us, uh, because I, I was enlisted first. Uh, and I went to OCS. I did not go to West Point or ROTC or any of those. I did not have a college degree. Um, and I worked in the unpopular area as far as active, regular army was concerned and special forces. They weren't real, they, they didn't care much for us. Uh, I got caught up in the rift. And there was actually, my understanding, it was 20,000 captains. I was a captain at the time. Were, were caught in that reduction in force. And they said, you can go back to being a sergeant or you can get out. And I chose to get out. Um, I'd worked too hard to become an officer and do the things I'd done. And I was also, I'll be honest with you, I was a little bit bitter. In fact, I was a lot bitter at the time because I'd done all of this, I'd, I'd risked my life, and they decided they didn't need me anymore. Mm. So I was, I was, I was bitter. Mm -hmm. I don't blame you. Uh, yeah. So I got out and uh, then went on to continue my military career because I ran into this, I was on a flight someplace and I ran into, and this will be part, maybe we'll add on to this. Um, I met this major. He was in the National Guard. He was, he was full time in the National Guard. And we were talking a little bit, and he says, you know, I kind of like your style. He says, why don't you come by and see me at the National, California National Guard headquarters? So I said, okay. And I was living in and around Sacramento. That's where my, my home was. And so I went in, and I talked to him a little bit, and he says, I'll tell you what, I have a place for you if you want to join the California National Guard. And I said, well, why not? i got some experience, and I'm trying to go to college so I could use the extra, extra money. So I joined the California National Guard as a part-time soldier while I was trying to go to college. Um, and that's how I was able to now then extend my military career. You went into the California National Guard. How many years were you in the Guard for? Well, I was in the National Guard both part-time and full-time uh, for nearly 20 years. I had spent seven years Actually, it was 19 years. I'd spent seven years in, on active duty, enlisted an officer, and then went the California National Guard. The first part of my time in the Guard, I was, um, I was a part-time soldier because I was going to college. And then during that time frame, 
I got custody of my son, sole custody of my son, who was only 18 months old at the time. And I needed a better income. And they had some openings in the California National Guard for me to go full time. I could go full time and work with them as a soldier, full time. So I chose to do that. And then, so that's how I got full time, how I got full time and how I extended my military career in the California National Guard. And when you retired, uh, what was your rank? I was a Lieutenant Colonel when I retired. I managed to continue to work and keep myself mostly out of trouble. And so I was able to gain a few ranks and, and retired. And I was just thinking about this. That's been 30 years ago. I, I just, because that was in 93, 30 years. I, I didn't realize, it, it doesn't seem like I've been retired that long. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Time flies. It does. <laughs> too, too fast when you get older. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then following the National Guard when I retired, I was getting ready to figure out what I wanted to do. I, I was, uh, I wasn't 50 yet. I figured if I do something, I ought to do something before I'm 50. Um, and get a job. Well, it happened to be one of the part-time California National Guard guys that I was, I was working with a lot. He was in the San Francisco Fire Department, and we had talked a lot. And Mike, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, he said, you know, why don't you go apply and become a firefighter in San Francisco? He says, they're, they're hiring. And I says, I don't, Mike, I don't, I don't know nothing about being a firefighter. And he says, he says, they'll train you. And I says, but I'm pretty old. He says, you can't be too old now. And, and he says, I says, but I'm not in very good. You know, I've, I've been beat up a lot, you know. Uh, and he says, you're in better shape than most of the people I know in the fire department right now. So anyway, uh, I went down and I applied. Uh, and I, ha I wasn't out of the service. I was still in the National Guard when I was applying and taking the tests and stuff. Well, me and 7,200 other applicants were at Moscone Center in San Francisco trying to take a test, the initial test, to see if we can qualify to be uh, selected in the San Francisco Fire Department. And I walked out of there because I have a hearing issue, and it was a videotape that you had to write the answers to, uh, little problems and things. And I walked out of there and said, mm, this ain't going to happen because... I was having trouble hearing. Mm. Well, I walked out of there and I called Mike McKinley and said, uh, Mike, I don't think it's going to happen. Well, Mike happened to also work in the training division for the San Francisco Fire Department. And so he had access, he got access, that he was notified of the people and how they did. And he gets back to me a few days later and he says, well, I think you're going to be in the department if you can find me, buddy, because out of 7,200 other people, I scored 28 on the list. And I went, oh, okay. Well, but now I had to pass a few other things. And one was the medical, to see if I was medically fit. And that took some challenges, but I passed that. And the other was the physically fitness. And I just had shoulder op surgery about three months prior. And part of it, a lot of it has to do with working with the upper body. And I just trained and trained and trained and trained. And I was selected, and I got in uh, several months later because of how the hiring system went. And then I became a firefighter in San Francisco. And that's how I got in, and that's how I did. So that was a good career. So I, I picked another career where you're challenged, and you go out and just put your, you know, you put it all on the line sometimes. But I did that for 17 years and stayed a, just a base firefighter. I enjoyed that part of it. Uh, I didn't want the politics to go try to make rank. I'd done that, so mm -hmm. I enjoyed just being a firefighter. Does that, you know, does that kind of fill in the blanks from mm -hmm. then till now? <laughs> <laughs> and back to SOG. Uh, SOG personnel were known for practical jokes and antics. Um, do you have a funny story you can tell the audience? Oh boy, let me see if I can have fun one that's this that's legal, uh, <laughs> legitimate. All sorts of we did all sorts of crazy things. Uh, I'm trying to think of the one that would be a practical joke. We did a lot of things that weren't very joking, but uh, uh, let me. Th 
Let me think. Boy, there's a lot there's of them. There's probably so many to. Yeah, choose there's from. there's quite a few of them, but most of them are pretty. Uh, uh, well, what we do is is one of the things we do is we all had jeeps, and they said, "Well, how do you all have jeeps or, or, or transportation?" He says, "Because they only gave a few to each unit." Well, what we would do is we'd go to town. And if we found the one that wasn't properly locked up, we would uh, we'd have a spray can and we had a little stencil with our decal on it, and we'd quickly spray the, the bumpers on the Jeep and we'd bring them back. And we all had a Jeep. <laughs> so that was fun. And another one was at the CCN camp. They, <laughs> a couple of guys went out one night or one day, and they stole a howitzer and drove it back to the camp. They were going to use it for their self-defense. And, and finally the artillery people figured out where it was, and they come to get it, but nobody in that group knew how to drive it. So they had to <laughs> beg us to drive it back to their compound. So those are things we did. Uh, they were outlandish. A lot of things were fairly risque, and I'll leave them out of the out of the out of the context of this, but you had to, uh, and, 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 and a little add to that. What we did was, we hung it out there. We hung it out there really far. Doesn't mean it was any necessarily any more dangerous than what the infantry guys did, or artillery, or any of the uh, other people did, but we really hung it out there. And so, to compensate for that tension, we had dark humor, and we did things that were not by the books, but were able to release some some tension mm -hmm. and pressure. And I think that's that's why we did so many antics, and part of the reason why we got away with it, because most people just wanted to leave us alone. We kind of <laughs> hoped we'd go away, but we would never went away, you know. Uh, so kind of like one of those, you know, the redheaded stepchild or the, the, you know, the relative that you really don't want to have around during, <laughs> during, during a formal session. But that was, that was how we yeah. were. We and were, for everything you guys did, you guys deserved to have some fun. We had to have fun. You mm -hmm. had to release. Um, and that was, that was how we did it. And even amongst ourselves, um, we'd do that, you know, play, play tricks and jokes. Sometimes they didn't turn out so good, but most of the time they were they were taken that way. <laughs> so, and we still do it. Uh, oddly enough, we still do that, you know, <laughs> with each other, even in our uh, advanced uh, age. We still try to find a trick every now and then to pull on somebody. So, what year did you first attend the Special Operations Association reunion, SOAR? Well, I, I, I first attended the very first one in 1977. Uh, I'm a, a charter member. I have my, my number is 20. So uh, I've been with them for a long time. I took a long break from them, uh, but got back to work back in, in Baldwin about 15 years ago or so. So it was right off from the start. SOG was classified for 20 years. Was going to SOAR therapeutic for you to be able to talk uh, to your friends there? Absolutely. Uh, not only just to be able to talk with the friends, but also find out about them, and also find out, re reconnect with people I didn't even realize that I uh, had worked with. And then I was able to find out who the name and meet the person that led the team that came in and rescued me. That was, that was very important. So, so SOAR has been really great. It's a good, it's a good organization, and it's helped me a lot. Good. I heard that the early days of SOAR were kind of wild. What is the wildest story you heard about? Oh, they were wild, all right. One of the, one of the stories that's always fun is uh, Larry Kimball. Kimball, uh, he. It was the third SOAR, I think. It was at uh, the, the landmark. 
Well, somebody brought a pig, and Larry got super drunk, and the next morning we found him in the bushes hugging the pig. <laughs> and, and we've teased him about that ever since. That's one of the fun stories. Oh, uh, there was a lot of, lot of drunk stories. We used to just, we had one guy came in, uh, Ben Lyons, was in a wheelchair. He'd gotten in an accident after the military. And we were at Caesar's Palace. Well, we couldn't, he couldn't get in. That was before ADA, and he couldn't get in with his wheelchair into the rooms. So we took the doors off all the rooms we had so he could get, the do get, in, through the, get in through the doors to see everybody. <laughs> Caesar's Palace wasn't very happy about that one. Oh, wow. Yeah, I can imagine that. <laughs> so... Anything else? Yeah, it was just they're just just they're stories after stories after stories of things that went on there, but they've all they've all come out okay. No, nobody's mm -hmm. caused any major problems that I can know of. You're now part of the Special Operations Association board. What is your title on the board, and what do your duties consist of? Well, right now I'm just recently got on the board, and I'm uh, a board member. Uh, uh, with, with, a, with, a, with a board of directors, uh, and I'm a director as they, as they say, but I have a special operation. They've asked me to be chairman of the POW MIA committee, of which I now am associating with several different agencies. And the, and the object is we're trying to continue to push forward and advocate bringing those soldiers home bringing their remains identified and bringing them home so we can get the families can get closure with them. There's 1,293, I think now, or 1,290 uh, soldiers who are unaccounted for, MIA. Uh, 135 of those are Special Forces soldiers, and 68 of those, 66 of those, excuse me, are actually special operations soldiers who have not come home yet. And that's our job, is to try to push and help bring them home. Okay, yeah. well, I wanted to thank you so much for sharing your story and all the work that you've done. You're, you're so. very welcome. <laughs> I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to do this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So this concludes our interview with uh, David and Gordon.